Marvel comic books always had a great bunch of villains to choose from in the Spider-Man universe. So many great Marvel artists and writers had developed these wonderful characters and written stories and had drawn great images to go along with them that it was a very easy task to pick those wonderful tales and images that we wanted to make this film based upon. A few months after we got the initial story, the idea came about, let's introduce the symbiote, let's introduce the black suit, and of course that means only one thing, let's introduce Venom. Hey Parker. The symbiote is the ultimate story in the comics and that's Eddie Brock who becomes Venom. Venom has a very unique origin story. How do we tell that story and do justice to the character who is arguably the most popular uh, Marvel character of all time? Venom is pure, gleeful, delicious evil. I always think with great power comes great fun. You know, we, we didn't want to spend a lot of the movie explaining its origins or where it came from, so it came from outer space. <laughs> you know, that seemed like that was true to the comics without all the astronaut stuff. The symbiote famously first appeared in the Secret Wars in the Spider-Man comics. And in the comics, it's really usually seen as a slightly expanding, black, oily type substance. You know, when you make a movie, you can't do exactly with something that looks good in a comic book doesn't necessarily look good on film. We wanted it to seem like an alien thing, to move in a way that we hadn't seen quite before, but something that wasn't in defiance of its liquid form. When you look at it in the final version of Spider-Man 3, you're gonna see something that's much more alive, that has many more tentacles and pieces to it. And a lot of that came from our illustrator, EJ, who just took that initial concept of the goo and said, okay, how can we push this further? I mean, the goo was kind of a, a major thing, you know, and that's a perfect example of how in comics, the goo works, but in the real world, you gotta feel that it's different and it's a little more vicious. When we first approached the symbiote alien, everybody brought something to the table in terms of designs and artwork and sculptures even, and, jars of different kinds of goo and it would take tongue depressors and look, lift them out and look at them. It, it took us quite a bit of time to kind of figure out what goo should look like. And the interesting thing about this movie, just figuring out what goo looks like is not going to cut it. We also needed to figure out how goo moves. We didn't want it to have a structure like an exoskeleton or bones or anything like that, an internal structure. And yet it had to have form and it had to have movement so we had to come up with a way to animate it and make it move that satisfied us and that uh, didn't defy its very liquid nature. So how do you take essentially a black puddle and make it aggressive and make it frightening and bring it to life? There was an animation of goo crawling on Spidey's arm that was based on uh, one of our concept artists EJ. He came up with a really beautiful, intricate artwork, and the animators kind of took it to heart and really replicated almost by keyframe. And once we, we nailed that, everybody kind of collectively just said, hey, this is it. I think across the board, everybody found something in there that was menacing and predator-like enough, but not passive. challenge the goo has been just um, in that it's it's unlike any kind of character personally I've ever worked on and um, it, it, it's just that it, in that it doesn't have a shape and, and so often we associate the shape of a character with that character you know we talk a lot about 
um, animals, you know, as far as like cobras, the way they kind of rear up and strike, or scorpion stings, or snakes, how they slither, and we, we looked at the animal kingdom, I think, a little bit there, and believe me, I think every one of the artists around here has a stack of, of comic books where we're constantly just on our own, just thumbing through and looking to like what the different artists throughout Marvel's history have done. Venom is a character that most excited us because it is a character that has its origins with Peter. When Peter puts this symbiote on, it begins to take on the imprint and the abilities of Spider-Man. Once it attaches itself to you, it enhances those kind of more negative or darker qualities of somebody's character. So yes, it's Spider-Man. He's our hero, but our hero now is being tested. That black substance is drawn to negativity. And I think when it senses Peter's darkness, his hatred for Flint Marco, his terrible sense of guilt and his pride, it, like a beacon, brings the stuff toward him. Sam always saw it as kind of comparable to alcoholism or drug addiction or something because the black suit gets on him and makes him feel powerful. Good. We are actually using the same fabric. We're dyeing it a different color. We're changing the, the color of the highlights on it. We're changing the eyes slightly. Um, and we're coating it with a, a, a printed grid, which is printed in, in plastazole, which we're able to screen print onto the suit. And the grid system that you may be aware of from the first suit now is printed in a kind of black sheen Black suited Spidey is um, is much more aggressive, and he's um, he's much stronger, and he's more uh, brutal. We try to convey that part of his personality in the motion by having him um, move a little quicker here and there, um, hunch his shoulders a little bit more. So this is what we call Animation Sweatbox, and um, all of the animators gather in here and we talk about our shots, and um, right now we're looking at one of the shots from Peter Giliberti, and you know, we still want to show the twist, so this moment where he's pulling on the web is, uh, is a really good moment to initiate that turn, I okay. think. I can make that more forceful, I guess, by speeding it up and twirling him a little bit faster. That would be great, yeah. And then we can kick the legs out straighter, too. There's a bunch of shots in the subway sequence when he's fighting with Flint Marco where he'll do things in a sort of a rougher way. Peter just starts out and ends up railroading over the top of him with his newfound powers. And railroading being kind of appropriate because they're fighting between trains. They're falling 300 feet through the air between train tracks. And all the time, Peter is unleashing for the death of his uncle. When he finally has to make a decision to get rid of it, it's, it's hard for him. In the bell tower sequence, I think that uh, it's, it's a really critical story point and then that Peter's finally getting, getting rid of his burden and, and getting rid of the goo and it's being transferred to Eddie who soaks it up. And when it's leaving Peter Parker and the bell's chiming, uh, we, we want to show it in a weakened state and it's shriveling and it's oozing away and slinking away and the shots at the end where it's actually found Topher found a new host, it, it gets revitalized and it's attacking and, and, and its energy's back and we tried to give it a little more aggression as it's you know found its new, you know, its new body. This is an example of uh, some of what animation does and kind of how we get uh, 
data from animation to effects. Well, the different colors here help us uh, identify which um, pieces go with which data sets. And then we can uh, call out where we want to add more detail. We can call out where we want, where we want to add um, surface properties or whatnot. <laughs> Um, there's a little bit of a cheat, of course, um, uh, Topher Grace did not actually swallow the camera when uh, they shot this on set. Filming the scene where this black tar-like goo was dripping all over me and I had wires attached to my face that people on fishing poles were pulling up and then at people below me pulling my face down. I mean, when you see that I'm in pain, I mean, I, I'm like, not a lot of acting required that day. We had asked Topher Grace to come in and talk about the role, and he just, he was what was written. I was so honored when I was called to just meet with him, let alone, you know, I mean, it was a great day sitting in that office and just have Sam Raimi tell me, I didn't know why he was telling me the whole plot of Spider-Man 3. He's gonna jump in at some point and tell me why I was there. He's fun and scary, and he's just a, another great addition to the ensemble. The reason we go with Venom, because we show you what happened if the symbiote uh, gets attached to someone that is truly evil, that doesn't have the character of Peter. Venom basically has similar strengths as Spider-Man, but, but just stronger, more agile, more vicious. It's a little bit, anything you can do, I can do better. Well, just like Sandman appears in so many different forms in the movie, our Venom also kind of has these different phases of him, too. I just got this image in my mind of, you know, these things just, you know, literally pulling his eyes open. And, and, and so those drawings really sparked a resonance in Sam. It then led to the idea, okay, well, how is this guy constructed? What Sam still wanted was Eddie Brock uh, inside that suit. He didn't, uh, you know, he wants his actor. My specialty is to really ground a design or, or an illustration in something that could work in the real world. You have seams, you have things that need to be covered. And the webbing just kind of came out and then, it, and then it became this whole thing, oh yeah, this could be, you know, what if the webbing was very vicious? What if it looked like it was gripping him? What if you really felt the pain of this thing on him? It becomes very much um, almost a, an organic um, structural element within the suit. To get into, if I'm doing the makeup for Venom, it's about an hour to get into just the suit. He would first sit in the makeup chair and put on the appliance pieces onto his face. It was a four hour process. It's kind of a, a tough portal to go through, but once you're on the other side, you can really have a lot of fun. Oh, you're being filmed. That's why you're so charming. That's not, oh, please. <laughs> I'm a very no. I'm joking. I was even fixing his venom. I was like makeup art, because we were high up, so I had to fix his little whatever these things are called. The webbing that crawls up his neck. There's four, four versions. There's the, the makeup that Topher will wear, where you still see a lot of Topher for the dialogue scenes. There's a closed mouth venom. There's an open mouth venom, both of which are worn by stunt guys. There's also a CGI double too, for when you know that does something that no human can do. But to me, the best part of the whole experience was they were scanning my body and they said, uh, you know, this will be great because we can use this for your action figure. And I went like, action figure? <laughs> it hadn't even occurred to me. And then when we were doing the motion capture, you know, that took a good two hours to put a thousand dots on my face. The scope in terms of visual effects with Venom, all spectacular. Never wound. What you can't kill. By the very end, by the time that it's the final battle between Peter and, and Venom, he turns into what we've called comic book Venom because it's based on the most like crazy designs you saw in the comic book where everything is just alive and squirming around. <laughs> It's like 
can affect extravaganza, basically. This black substance is really a metaphor for the darkness that comes over Peter's heart. All the darkness that's in all of us, I think that black suit really just brings that to the forefront. The person I really want to please is me, because I, I read these comic books. Venom is, is our interpretation of the comic book, um, and, I, and I think the fans will be happy.